everybody. I'm a filmmaker, I'm a director and a producer, and I will speak about ethics today. Uh, <laughs> Um, so I chose to speak more about ethics in documentaries because, well, first I make a lot of documentaries, but also because, you know, we tend to think uh, as, on one hand as doc on documentaries as if they are reflecting uh, reality, but actually um, I'm going to remind you today uh, in my speak that behind the film there is always a director and, you know, we are basically choosing what you're gonna see on the screen. And um, so we are basically dealing all the time with a lot of ethical questions. And, and I think the first time that it's really dawned to me, my, the power of, you know, the, the power that I have in my hand is when I did my first film, To Die in Jerusalem. Uh, you know, I, I graduated uh, from college. It was my master's thesis. And, and luckily HBO bought it and um, and the first night that I know, that was a really short way to tell the whole story of how it went, but it doesn't matter. It was basically uh, the film uh, tell, I went to school in Illinois from all places, and, and, um, and I wanted to do a film about the conflict. And there was a bombing in Jerusalem that a Palestinian girl blew herself in the entrance to, to a grocery store and killed herself and another Israeli girl, uh, Rachel Levy, who they were basically at the same age, and also the guard who prevented her from entering the store. It was in Kiryat Yobel, if anyone remembers. And basically I did, I followed the two mothers of the two girls on this long journey that at the end they met. And um, it's a real reflection of reality, unfortunately also today, as it was back then in 2007 that I finished the film. But what I want to say is that, so when the film aired on HBO and the first night there were you know, over a million people who watch it. I think this is when I realize how much power I have uh, in my hand and how careful I have to be when, you know, how I use it and what is the message that I'm uh, delivering in my work. So we can go to the next slide. Um, so first I wanted to actually shift the, the conversation to um, the responsibility that we have as a documentary filmmaker to our subject matters. Because, you know, we are telling stories uh, of people. And um, the first, I always like to give examples uh, of uh, films and, and, you know, work that we, that, you know, I, I situation that I've been at. And, and I wanted to give, to give us a, like a static case to talk about Web Junkie, which is a documentary that I've made with another filmmaker, Sho Shlam. Um, about uh, basically um, China is the first country in the world to declare internet addiction as a clinical disorder and through China there are rehab centers for kids that are addicted to the internet and we filmed in one of those rehab centers and you know it was first of all you know we are coming from here so there were all these cultural difference into understanding uh, what are the more sensible things you know for them but then also we needed to be very careful because, you know, for them, the, the fact that their children are in this camp is like, like, I don't know, it's like worse, I'm trying to put it in words, it's worse than being criminals. And, and also there is a whole sense within the Chinese society of face, which is like, you know, there is, I mean, I can't put it, it's a very complicated concept, but if I have to simplify it, I will say respect and honor and, so, so we, we had to figure out how to work with these kids and their family in a way that, you know, we are, um, I think we lost the mic, but <laughs> that we are, you know, ethically, it's okay, that we are basically, I can continue, I think everybody can hear me, right? <laughs> so, so I think that we had to figure out basically a way that we are, you know, ethically responsible to that. So I'll show you now a little trailer. <laughs> 
All right. So, so basically, you know, there was, you know, we have to, and that's actually happens often in, in, you know, in my work, that even, for example, when we sign releases with the subject matter, you know, our responsibility to them is beyond, you know, the legal responsibility that to do the, the right thing legally, you know. We have much bigger responsibility, not on, and again, not only because we developed this very long relationship, you know, some of the films, I mean, like, Web Junkie was shot over the course of the, the core shooting was three months because that's the course of treatment for these kids. But you know, some of the films that we do, it's like years of shootings. You know, it's like two, like to die in Jerusalem that I mentioned, it was four years of shooting. You know, sometimes you follow people and they become, like you become a big part of their life. So you have a real responsibility to the content and what you show, but sometimes it's, other responsibility like you know you be, you develop this relationship with them that you speak to them every day and then you finish the film and you don't need to speak to them every day but you can't just like disappear to people you know so so there are a lot of ethical and responsibility questions towards the subject matters and and you know um, in many levels and that was just one example I think I have some more photos is it working the thing yeah, no. that it should work now. It's not? Okay, so let's move. Yeah, that's like an example of, uh, you know, they're going through a lot of therapy. Uh, in, in China, actually, um, psychology, uh, it's a very new field, because during the communism, uh, at communist time, there was no, you know, there was no, like in the university, they didn't study psychology, so all the psychologists are very young. And it was very interesting for us to see those young women that are uh, giving, like, uh, you know, um, treatments and, and working with parents and about, you know, all those things was very interesting. So now I want to talk about something. I always like to push the boundary and I'm not more scared of speaking about politics and everything like that. I feel that actually that's a big part of, of what I need to do and my role in society. Um, and one of the latest uh, film that I produced uh, called Censored Voices, uh, in Hebrew, if anyone heard about it. Um, it's uh, got a bit, I mean, we released it theatrically, it premiered at Sundance and in Berlin, and it did very well internationally, and also actually quite well in Israel. Uh, we got very good uh, press coverage, and we released theatrically. And there was, um, and often when we screen, the film is about the 67 war. I'm going to show you a short trailer in, in a second. And, but the ethical questions that, that came, well, first of all, as always, there is an ethical question about the subject matters, which after I show the trailer, we can discuss. But the other ethical question is a lot of people will come to us and say, you know, we understand why you want to show this film in Israel, but you're really irresponsible of showing it outside of Israel. So I'm going to show you the trail and then I'll give you my answer to this uh, question. המלחמה <laughs> So first of all, uh, the ethical question of showing something very political outside of Israel. So first I want to tell you that I think in many ways you know, we travel a lot, I travel a lot with my work and I'm meeting a lot of people and in many ways we are um, 
שגרירים, ambassadors of Israel outside Israel, as, you know, as artists, as filmmakers. Uh, and, and I think in many, in many times our meetings and conversation with audience in different places actually very, is actually helping a lot uh, the Israel. And I think also for me, you know, being showing that the, you know, Israeli artist and the Israel society is able to listen and to create this kind of content, that's to me actually something that shows something very good about us as a society, that we are able to take criticism. And, and to me, I actually, from, from our travel with the film, I think that the, the reaction and what we get is it doesn't feed the, the DBS or other movements. It's actually the opposite. And quite frankly, I have to tell you that the, those people who are, you know, anti-Israel, they're not going to come to our films. They're not going to even listen to this content. And, and I can tell you that the only meeting I had ever with this kind of organization was when I screened my film Dancing in Jaffa, which we'll talk about later, which is very, I mean, it's political, but it's very non-political and it's very uplifting and it's very kind of pro-peace and very, so I had a screening of this film in France and there were a group of, of people basically that, so I came and I introduced the film and then there were like half of the audience stood up with like black shirts with like boycott Israel and you know, threw like stink bomb in the theater and there was the police, anyway, it was like a big thing, but it was not in censored voices, you know what I mean? It's like, and that's the only, and, and these people haven't seen the film. So, so I really, I, I don't think, I think the opposite. I think that actually that the fact that we are able to show that, you know, we are, it shows a lot about our society and actually a lot of people coming to us after screening saying that, you know, they're actually surprised to see the sensibility of the Israeli soldiers. And, and I think that's also an important debate, of course, inside Israel, uh, that it's very important for us to do also as a filmmaker, as an artist, is to actually bring those discussions, especially at the time like now that, you know, Shavrim um, Shtika, Breaking the Silence, become these like monsters that people don't even know what they do, but what they know and think is that they're totally anti-Israel. And again, I'm not advocate for breaking the silence, but I think that there is a lot of um, like lack of information in the public that are being fed from like you know headlines. And I think that part of our job is actually to um, to be able to deal and to make work and to discuss those issues that you know. And and you know the interesting thing about film, especially if we are able to bring people to the theater, is that they are there for like 90 minutes. You know, there is no TV. They're usually they don't look much at their phone, and and we actually, if we are doing a good job in telling our story, we are we really get like 90 minutes with them. So anyway, so I'm very proud of. Actually, I just came back two days ago from Berlin. Uh, we were nominated for another award, so and it was uh, anyway. So, <laughs> but. We didn't win, Cartel Land win, but that's a very good film. So as I told Daniel, it's probably going to win. The, it's nominated for the Oscar, and it's probably going to win. I mean, it's between this film and Amy. One of them is going to win. So, we, so I told Daniel, I told him, at least if we lose, we lose for Cartel Land. That's OK, right? <laughs> <laughs> that was from Sundance. Um, and you know, just I, I just gave some photos to ex to you know one of the other important thing uh, for us in the in the work that uh, in for me in the work that I do is that it creates dialogue, and it you know it brings uh, it you know it's the ability to shed lights on on topics that otherwise people won't necessarily see, and this is more the director of censored voices, and um, another example of ethics is dancing in Jaffa. Uh, first of all, you know, when you, when we work, when I work with kids, there are whole sets of ethical questions that you deal with because first of all, you know, they are young kids. Sometimes they'll tell you a lot of things that are, you know, they don't really understand it. Uh, you have to deal with parents, schools, school system. Like, you know, there is a, a whole lot of different issue. And then, of course, you know, I, I mentioned it a bit at the beginning, but I'll say it again because I think it, 
we have to remember that even documentaries, that they are, you know, it's real people, it's really they're saying what they're saying. Like for me, I would never tell someone, can you say this, one, two, three, four? I mean, I might tell them, can you repeat it? I might, you know, of course, whenever the camera is present, it already affects the situation, you know? But, so, so there are ethical guidelines that, that for me are very important for anything I do, but I, I still want you to remember that a documentary is a film. And, and even if I look at this crowd, and I'm gonna put a camera, and I'm gonna just, you know, do a close up on one of you. And that's what you're gonna see. So the experience that you will see through the camera is very different than my experience here, even if the camera was standing here. So anyway, so I'll show you a little trailer. Boys, come over here. Hello. Boys. I was born in Jaffa, but we left when I was four years old. And what I can give back to children is ballroom dancing. The program is 10 weeks, Palestinian and Jewish children together. May I have this dance, please? <laughs> No. Uh, I think we're going to cancel the school. What I'm asking them to do is to dance with the enemy. At the beginning, she was like a closed flower, and now she's like this. If you start with child and they learn to respect themselves first and then they can respect other people as they're growing up, this is my hope. All right, so um, one day, by the way, this film was screened in Israel, but uh, Keshet actually bought the rights to broadcast it. Uh, and uh, one day they'll find a time between Big Brother <laughs> and uh, I don't know what else is going on, but um, I, what? Cash it. So I'm, I'm actually very proud that that happened because, you know, most of, of the films, of the documentaries that I make are, you know, we're working a lot with the S Doco and a little bit with Channel 8 and a bit with the others, but, uh, you know, when Cash it actually bought the rights to this film, I was very excited. Uh, and uh, but they haven't yet it, <laughs> aired it yet. <laughs> Every now and then they call me and they say, "Oh, we're thinking, you know, on the second day of Rosh Hashanah, it's a great day because they're very proud of the film." And then they call me like two days later and they say, "You know, Channel Ten just did something, and you know, we really need to now beat the ratings of them, and it, we can't do it." So anyway, but they'll air it eventually. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is actually one of the films that, uh, that uh, I did that sold uh, the best internationally. Like it had a very wide uh, theatrical release in the US and in Europe. And um, I don't know, I'm really hoping actually Cash It Will Air It Soon because I feel that uh, it's, it's really film that show that we can work together. And you know, one of the stories I wanted to share with you about it is that uh, actually when we first came to Kesha to show, it's like one of the things they told me, but how are you going to show the tension and the conflict with his, within Jaffa? Because, you know, Jaffa, it's such a, you know, it's um, it's like, you know, everybody lives together. It's like a mixed city. Of, and it was incredible because they're actually one of the amazing thing in Jaffa is that almost every week there is a demonstration about something. 
and always it becomes violent because there is actually a lot of tension, you know, not in the old city or in the Namal where we go, you know, in the port where we go to have fun, but beyond that there is actually a lot of tension. And, and to me, the, the sim symbolic to that, you haven't seen the film, but one of the main kids, uh, Allah, who is the guy who, you know, on the boat with Lois, with, uh, you know, the blonde uh, Jewish girl. So, you know, he, at the time that we filmed the film, he was in fifth grade, and he barely spoke Hebrew. And to me, that's just symbolized, and of course, the Jewish kids don't speak Arabic. So to me, that's just really a symbolic to see the gap. And of course, now it's even more so with everything that is happening. Oh, good. And that's just us working. And, and, you know, there is, again, you know, speaking of ethics, there is a lot of, I mean, working with kids is very complicated. And it's funny because someone told me recently that in almost all my films, there are kids. Like, if you think, I mean, well, censor voices, not so much, but even though they were 18 or 20 when they spoke originally in 67, but yeah. Um, well, I guess not. Well, there are kids too. <laughs> um, you know, another, another uh, film I did that uh, was, uh, I made a documentary, The Gogo Boys, about Menachem Golan and Yoram Globus. And um, it was really, I mean, for me, it was a great experience. I, I filmed them for about three years, and it was the three last years of Menachem before he passed away. And it was uh, quite incredible. And actually, I, I, uh, that's a fun film, other than the, you know, the other film. And it was really amazing for me. And even if you don't like the films, uh, that's, I mean, I, I think you will enjoy the film, uh, because uh, it, it's really like a, a personal journey of them to, you know, like they had this American dream to make it in Hollywood. And I think that's something that we can all relate about, you know, us living here. And in the, this case, they're from Tiberias. And they, you know, they wanted to basically, they had this big American dream to make it big. And they actually did. And I think a lot of Israelis, even if you know their films, and we all know at least some of them, like Salah Shabbati and, um, and Mivtai Yonatan and some other films that they've done, I don't think we realize to what extent they were big and influential um, internationally. Uh, I'm going to show you a trailer that was done in Japan, because that's where the film was the most successful <laughs> from all places. <laughs> Meet Israeli duo Menachem Golan and Yoram Globus. They have a dream of taking over Hollywood with their company, Canon Films. And what kind of movies do they make? Some critics call them schlock films, but actually they're just plain low-budget movies. Did you ever make a $30 million movie? Never. I don't know what to do with 30 million. I, I can make 30 movies, maybe. We thought that it will conquer the world. You knew there was going to be guns, you knew there was going to be chicks, you knew there was nudity, there was violence. Cannon was synonymous with awesome in the 80s. If they can leave the theater feeling a little bit better than when they went into the theater because the good guy does come out on top. I think you're going to be surprised how anxious the networks would be to do business with you. And he says to me in French, Vous êtes Monsieur Goran? And he rubbed my head. Karin, bring me blood sport. I'm going to make you a movie star. They were experts at financing it, selling it, and then making it. They were selling before and then making after. Les panneaux d'affichage qui envahissaient la croisette, c'était Canon qui débarquait. Pour moi, et faire des films, c'est une grande histoire d'amour. But to date, they have not made what I would say is a really fine film. You have to make hits in order to survive. It just didn't happen for them. They call us Go Go Boys. Go, go! <laughs> it means go, go! So yeah, it was it was so weird to me. Like so, I, I was actually invited to Japan when it was released in theaters, 
Well, that's the date for the DVD release. <laughs> it's coming up. Uh, so it, it was fun, you know, it was great, and I, I always wanted to go to Japan, so we all came. Uh, I mean, I came with my uh, partner and my daughter and, uh, and our daughter, and it was so incredible for me. Even though, you know, I've, I've researched and I know so much about them, just to see, like, you know, to be in Tokyo and to show the film to, like, a full house of Japanese that coming with t-shirts of Canon, which was really <laughs> crazy. And, and that's connect me to the beginning of my talk that I spoke about the impact. I mean, you know, this was, of course, you know, I'm not quite there yet <laughs> as they were, but you know, they made 300 films, more than 300 films that were screening all over the world. So that's just to show you the possibility of impact that you have when you do this kind of, of work versus, I mean, and I don't underestimate, I love theater and I love, you know, different kind of, of art, but the problem with theater is that you have to come to the theater and see so the, your reach is a bit limited. So the power of film is really, incredible and even more so today with um, you know internet that we do a lot of things online a lot of the industry is moving to streaming and you know and it's a bit a lot of filmmakers films a bit unclear about where it happened but actually to me I think that's actually only good because we are able to reach much more people and I think that's the important so I'm just going to tell you a little bit about some of the films in the making all right um, by a thread, which is just to tell you, the names are only working titles. For example, this name is going to change for sure. But this is a story that we have been filming, uh, I'm producing, that uh, we have been filming for a very long time. Um, this uh, kid uh, who is from Gaza, who basically, since he was a week old, he was transferred to Israel for a medical treatment at Chiba and he's been living in the hospital for six years and because of the security permits there, he's only with his grandfather, they are confined to the hospital, so they can't really leave. And if you have kids, you can only imagine what it is to grow up in a hospital that you can't go anywhere. Um, and, uh, and basically his father is a Hamas activist, so his father is denied entry to Israel. His mother was able to visit him twice. But actually what's nice about this film is that uh, the kid is fun and his grandfather and they're very uh, optimistic. And it's almost about this very impossible situation of at the one hand, you know, there was of course the war with Gaza and there is all this tension and all those things, were, but on the other hand, you know, um, the hospital is really giving life to this kid. And we are following basically till um, probably this summer that where he's going to leave the hospital. And the question is whether he's going to go back to Gaza, which means being with his family and with his mother. However, uh, the doctor think it's a death sentence for him because the healthcare system in Gaza is completely shattered. And, um, and to go, even if you have permits to cross areas, it's, if you're lucky, it takes a day till you get all the permits. And uh, if you're not lucky, it can take a week. And for him, he needs to be in a few hours in the hospital. And the other option is, of course, foster family in Israel, but that means a complete separation from his family. So it's this really impossible, but actually within the story, it's not so tragic um, because they're fun and optimistic and there are a lot of volunteers, and there is a lot of layers to this story. That's it. Rina, um, the director, is, uh, is a photographer, photojournalist, so we have those amazing photos. So we are really excited to share, it, <laughs> share them with you. <laughs> and this is Buma. So for example, if I spoke about those uh, impossible situation. So one of the volunteers, Buma in Bali, is, um, is actually a brief father. I think that's how you say it, right? Ab Shakur. Uh, he lost his son in a, uh, his son was a soldier and he, he lost him for a war. And he is, he's actually volunteering in driving a lot of the Palestinian patients from Gaza to the hospitals in Israel. Um, and he's also, uh, you know, he's, he became very close to Abu Naim, the grandfather, and they formed this, like, again, this impossible 
um, relationship. So, so there are a lot of great layers to this story to show the complexity within where we live. Uh, and this is a, another film that I'm uh, producing with the same uh, director, uh, with the same team of Censored Voices. We, we d made a decision that after we, you know, we made a film about 67 uh, that in many ways got us to the mess we feel. So now it's a time to, to make a film about why there is no peace and to look into Oslo. Because one of the things that we realize is that, you know, we all talk about Oslo, we always read about Oslo, but a lot of people don't know much about Oslo. Uh, so we, and, and I have to admit that the more we learn about Oslo and the more we delve into making and the research of this film, it's unbelievable, like how much we don't know. So we, f we felt it was, it's a very important film and, and we, and Daniel and Moore came up with this amazing, um, concept, creative concept of the Oslo Diaries. So basically everybody that was involved in this 1,100 days of secret uh, talk basically wrote a book, uh, a diary, a memoir about what happened. Uh, so um, basically it's, we are using it so through a more personal stories we are telling this uh, very interesting um, an important part of our, you know, we live and breathe Oslo every day, even if we don't realize that. So, um, so we do that. Uh, I can give you some example, but uh, anyway, that that's was taken by. We got this footage. We, you know, part of what we do is also an excessive archival research, and it, in censored voices, more did. And may, like all over the world, there are archives that we know that uh, haven't nobody showed since '67, and maybe even never uh, shown there. And the, the way we knew it is that if we went to an archive and the footage was on reel, you know, on film reels, that means since the '80s, whatever was screen is digitized in some way, whether on a tape or a hard drive somewhere. And if we had to go and look at the at the actual reel, that means it never shown, and there are a lot of material like that. So that, uh, so we do the same thing with Oslo now. We're doing really excessive research, and and this, for example, is a screenshot from a footage that was shot by an Israeli filmmaker who wanted to make a film about the behind the scene of Oslo. But when the peace process collapsed, he basically locked all his tape and he never touched it. And that was um, right after, right before the handshake, uh, actually. Um, behind the, you know, kind of like, you know, when Rabin and Perez and everybody else was like in their kind of green room before the, hand, the famous handshake in Washington. And it's a great scene where Rabin is like, you know, chain smoking and he's saying, well, is Arafat going to wear a uniform? Maybe I should wear a uniform too. And he was very worried about it. And it's a really great uh, moment. Uh, and this one also from his footage, he followed them right after the handshake to Morocco. It was the first time that an Israeli delegation was in Morocco. And you see uh, there is, well, later they change seats and you, you see like uh, the king of Morocco, Shimon Perez and Rabin, and later they change seats and Shimon Perez sits in the middle and he's translating because he speaks French and Rabin doesn't. And Rabin takes a piece of paper and he draws the map of Israel and he's showing the Gaza Strip and, <laughs> and the West Bank. And he explained to him that the most important things about Oslo is that actually they haven't discussed any of the main issue. So there was absolutely no discussion and that's why it's so successful. And it's really funny. <laughs> Anyway, so those are those moments that we are looking to find. I mean, it's funny, but in the scheme of the film, I think it will be a bit tragic. Anyway, <laughs> uh, that's another uh, film that uh, I'm uh, working on uh, about, I don't know if you guys remember, there was a story of a Mossad uh, a fighter who commits suicide in, the, in jail and there was uh, he was an Australian citizen uh, who actually he died in 2010 and the news broke in broke out to the press in 2013 and there are a lot of questions about you know the rights of the public to know uh, and why it was so secretive and also in our country on one hand of course we have to you know security is something that is very important and you know I don't underestimate it but also you know at least I feel a bit that sometimes the word security is you know is being used or misused by people that are able to use it and and you know it's like um, 
so anyway, so we are looking into this story and it was really interesting because, you know, when I, I we shot a, a small trailer, because the way the process works these days is that you can't raise any funding or any support if you don't actually have something to show them. So we, I went and I interviewed some, uh, you know, Mossad people and on this, so I did two shooting days and then Eva shot in Australia because the, the news broke that actually it's kind of a crazy story that the uh, ISO, the Australian Secret Service, called an Australian journalist and he, that's how the news broke, chain of event. So, uh, so I interviewed Mossad people and before the last interview on the second day I get a call from the censorship <laughs> to remind me this, the Sgana um, Tsenz or I don't know, like this number two in the censorship, <laughs> yeah, the deputy uh, of the censor to remind me that well, he already knows me because, of course, censored voices had to go through the censorship and some other films. You know, in Israel, uh, by the way, there is a law that every film has to go through the military censorship. Uh, of course, you know, if we make a film about Menachem Golan and Yoram Globus, they're not even interested in seeing it. But, um, but when we, for example, censored voices, we submitted to them. We had Michael Sfard with us, <laughs> uh, who is a famous lawyer who are dealing a lot with human rights and especially with Palestinian issues. So he came with us and we, it was a bit of a dealing and um, legally I can't tell you whether it was censored or not or what we had to take, but because <laughs> that's a, but, but the, the one thing I can tell you and this is what we said is that it was really insignificant and in many ways I'm very proud of that, that the, the, the censorship approved the film as is because it shows a big change that we made as a society since 67 that a lot of stuff were censored in. So we'll see what they do. The advantage is that Eva is Australian and uh, whatever she shots can't go through the censorship. So hopefully, but I don't know even if there are secrets. I mean, of course, when I interview Mossad people, they're not going to tell me things that this, you know, they're very trained. They know what to say and what they're not allowed to say. But the censor told me, trust me, I know there are a lot of things in this story that shouldn't be out. So we'll see, we are early on. Uh, and that's another film that, we're, that uh, I'm producing uh, called Breadhead, which is about uh, Max Lugavir, who is, um, uh, it's, it's really like an American film in many ways. Uh, he, basically his mom, when she was in her 50s, she started showing sign of dementia and uh, cognitive decline. And, uh, and basically he's going on this journey to see how lifestyle and, and uh, nutrition can prevent Alzheimer and other uh, cognitive decline. And, and nowadays there are very interesting research actually all over the world that's showing that, you know, uh, what you eat really affects you know, your chances of getting Alzheimer's or other kind of dementia. I'm saying Alzheimer because 80% of dementia is Alzheimer's. But there are Lewy body dementia and some others. And, and this is actually now the, the prevention is like really the kind of hot science. And um, anyway, when it's out, I hope you all will see it. And that's Mark's mom. And also, we do, I do other things. So one of the things that I did, I know I'm talking a lot about Shimon Peres. One of the things I did with uh, Mika, uh, Mika Almogo is uh, Peres' granddaughter, is that we did this film. And if you haven't seen it, Google Shimon Peres goes job hunt. Um, I had to bring something. That's Mika. That's why we have this photo. And uh, that was really fun to shoot. Of course, it didn't really jump from the airplane. I get that question a lot, believe it or not. <laughs> and so anyway, I wanted to show that so you see that we do a lot of other things.